Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Gianpaolo, and thanks also uh, Martina Maris, all the other organizers and the Institute for inviting me uh, to, to present this work. I, um, I must say that this is a bit of perspective, so I will leverage uh, on some work that we did in the past and, uh, and uh, discuss. Uh, I would like to open the discussion then to how uh, this can be used also for COVID uh, um, epidemic. Um, so, the, if, if we have a look at, uh, at the information that we have on clusters of transmission worldwide, we understand that there are a large majority of these clusters which occurred in closed settings. Uh, there is a small percentage of them that led, however, to a large number of cases. We saw them in hospitals, especially at the beginning of the epidemic when uh, protective equipment uh, probably was uh, not uh, uh, used and adopted by the entire personnel or, or maybe not adopted in the, in the right way. Elderly care, we still uh, see that. Uh, this is, for example, uh, looking at data that we have for France and Italy. It, is, uh, it amounts to about half of the deaths that we count so far, which of course is also related to the fact that, the, uh, that of, of the age as a risk factor. Uh, but then we saw also religious gatherings like the one that uh, um, that led to a, an explosion of cases in South Korea and also in a big cluster in the north of France at the beginning of the epidemic. More recently work at dormitories in Singapore and then of course we're all familiar also with the cruise ships. Um, if we look at other data which are coming from, uh, from Italy, uh, during the, 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 the period of lockdown, we see that still the majority of confirmed cases, uh, largest majority were coming from um, healthcare settings, especially the ones which are devoted to the care of the elderly. Uh, a smaller percentage coming from hospitals. I think uh, exactly for what we were saying before that now there is a, a much uh, a larger awareness on uh, protection and prevent and prevention. Uh, and then, of course, a fraction, a considerable fraction in households. So this is also due to the fact that everybody was in lockdown, and so there wasn't uh, so much uh, uh, other means of transmission. Uh, an interesting study that was conducted in Japan saw showed that the risk of transmission in closed settings is about 20 times higher than the risk of transmission in open air settings. And this may be related uh, to uh, possible uh, transmission through aerosols. So we, we, we know that the virus uh, from experimental studies can be contained also in aerosols. We don't know whether this is still, uh, the, 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 viral, the, the virus contained in these aerosols is still, uh, can still lead to infection, but um, empirical evidence shows that uh, the uh, prolonged contacts uh, in closed settings, of course, it's at higher risk. And indeed, uh, a, a mathematical modeling study uh, looking at uh, uh, imported versus local transmission worldwide, this was done with all cases that were available up to uh, end of February, showed that 80% uh, of secondary cases were generated by about 10% of infectious individuals. So all of this information clearly points to uh, the possibilities of having super spreading events, something that also for COVID-19 is something that we knew uh, happened very clearly for SARS. We know it happened also for MERS, uh, in especially uh, nosocomial infections, so within hospitals or from one hospital to another. And it was also very important for Ebola, for example, for uh, during funerals. Um, these events are important in the sense that, of course, our knowledge of the reproductive number that is an average uh, is misleading given the presence of these uh, super spreading events that can lead to uh, any, an early growth uh, that can uh, um, increase much more rapidly and also can lead to sustained transmission in later stages. And just to give you a, a pictorial a representation of what happened with MERS in the um, South Korean outbreak in the summer of 2015, this was uh, the uh, tracing uh, the outbreak investigation from a first patient that was the one uh, that the one highlighted here in in red um, that went as as they said uh, hospital shopping and so visited the multiple hospitals and then led to a lot, large outbreak at St. Mary's Hospital. And there, the patient moving from that hospital to Samsung Medical Center led to another outbreak, important outbreak, increasing the number of secondary tertiary infections there. 
Um, so with one single importation, uh, the outbreak measured uh, uh, almost 200 cases, uh, and so was of great concern. We know from the studies since uh, SARS and all the epidemics uh, that, that we mentioned uh, that, of course, there are several drivers for super spreading events. There are drivers which are, well, specific to the disease. And so here I'm just focusing on, uh, on uh, for example, on one specific disease. So what remains are drivers which are related to the host, uh, to its immunological response, whether the host uh, shows uh, symptoms, a uh, viral load which may be higher than uh, other individuals. Of course, it's also related to environmental conditions. And there, what we see from, uh, for example, the data and the evidence from COVID-19 is that co-location is important. Um, the, uh, the probability for super spreading events uh, in closed settings was uh, 30 times higher than the probability of observing uh, these super spreading events instead in outdoor environment. So co-location in closed settings, of course, is key, uh, seems to be key for uh, this increase in transmission. And then also uh, behavioral aspects, uh, which are mainly, from a mathematical point of view, this can be translated in a number of contacts that individual uh, establish. The patient number one in Italy, for example, was a very healthy and athletic uh, young man who, on the other hand, was extremely uh, active from a social point of view. So retracing its, uh, his history, uh, we, we understood that he went, uh, for example, uh, running a half marathon, uh, went, uh, uh, participated uh, um, to, to several uh, encounters with friends, family at a bar to watch uh, uh, sport and, and many other uh, social events of this type in the phase, in the phase in which was probably asymptomatic or in the prodromic phase. And so he led to a lot, of, uh, a lot of transmission. And this is exactly what I'm going to focus on. So on the number of contacts, I will uh, forget somehow uh, the, other, uh, the other drivers. Um, and I will, uh, I will um, mostly focus on contacts, uh, keeping in mind that the concepts we measured are contacts measured in a, in a closed setting because for technological reasons, this is what we can do. Indeed, we, we look, this, there are several approaches now and, and seen some time, as you can see from the dates here, that measure contacts between individuals. Uh, these approaches started from uh, paper surveys to video monitoring, to more recently unsupervised uh, technologies uh, through sensors. And sensors which are used for proximity contacts uh, are generally censored based uh, on radio frequency signals. Uh, these are peer-to-peer -peer RFID sensors that can communicate one to each other and they can measure proximity, face-to-face -face proximity at around one to two meters and uh, also measure these contacts every uh, 20 seconds. The signal of the uh, established contact is then relayed to an antenna uh, that is established in, a, in this closed setting. But now, nowadays, uh, these RFID sensors can also carry long enough batteries and enough CPU to keep in memory these contacts for quite a long time. Now, this is different from proximity contacts, which are now discussed uh, over the media because of the app, uh, apps uh, tracing uh, contacts for the outbreak investigation that we would like to implement uh, for uh, fighting a COVID epidemic. Because in that case, it's Bluetooth technology, which have different ranges and can also, in some conditions, uh, uh, go through, for example, certain obstacles like a, a thin wall or offices uh, which are just divided by, for example, glasses. Like this is exactly my, my case. When instead RFID signal is um, absorbed by the water of the body and so can clearly uh, provide, uh, by, by tuning the signal, can clearly provide an identification of the distance that is close enough within one and two meters and also can ensure that the two persons were facing each other instead of, for example, giving their back to each other uh, because otherwise the signal would be absorbed uh, by the body. Uh, there are several different studies which have been conducted and here I'm showing uh, a, a collaboration because I participated into this collaboration which is called Sociopatterns which is led by a team at ISI Foundation in Torino and by a team at CNRS in Marseille. Uh, these studies have been conducted in closed settings, again, because at the beginning, especially, there was the need to have an antenna, and also because you, have a you need to have a close population 
to ask individuals uh, to wear these uh, uh, RFID, which are, which are worn as a small tags uh, like in front of your body. Imagine like a, a badge for, for a conference. Um, several studies have been conducted in schools, so workplaces, and also in hospitals. And so if you look at uh, some, the data that we used are coming from uh, this, uh, this study that was conducted in 2013 by this collaboration, Sociopathians, uh, together with the uh, a team of uh, Philippe Van Ems in Lyon. Um, these are, uh, the study monitored uh, the interactions uh, of individuals within a short stage erratic unit. It was done only for four days, so clearly this is one other limitation of the study that we have just a short amount of time. Um, let's say contextualizing this was a, sort of the beginning of this type of experiments, so we need uh, to uh, likely this probably win, uh, will, will become uh, longer, uh, longer time studies and for larger population. 75 individuals were tracked, including uh, patients, nurses, which represented the largest majority of the population, and then also doctors and auxiliary uh, personnel. Um, in the plot you are seeing the number of individuals per class over time, uh, so whether they were patients, nurses, uh, doctors, and auxiliary personnel, and, and there we measure individuals who are active at that time. And for us, active means that they establish contacts. So we, we don't even look at, at the presence of individuals. We really look at whether they are uh, in contact with anybody else, because uh, uh, for us, that is the information that they are epidemiologically active in the sense that they can uh, transmit uh, uh, the disease uh, along that context. And of course, uh, we assume also that these contexts are the only mean for transmission of an infection. Um, if we investigate a little better these contexts, uh, we can see that in terms of percentage of contacts per class, uh, nurses are the ones who establish the largest number of contacts, but they're also the ones who establish the largest uh, duration of contacts. You can also see that the two things are not uh, directly proportional one to each other. For example, patients establish a larger number of contacts, but then uh, the duration uh, is likely smaller. So we have to take into account the two aspects the contacts established, but also their frequency and duration. And if you look at contacts between different classes of individuals, we still see, for example, that patient, uh, that nurses, nurses are the pair of uh, uh, classes of individuals who establishes, who, who have the longest duration of contacts, uh, then followed by patient nurses, and then uh, in third uh, rank, uh, there would be doctor, doctor. Um, and, and this accounting for the population that we have. If you remember, doctors are much uh, fewer individuals, uh, but still doctor-doctor interaction seems uh, to, to be quite large. Now, given this knowledge, uh, there are several interventions that typically in a hospital or in a healthcare facilities are, are put in place. Um, especially, for example, in reaction to a, an outbreak. Now, before COVID, so in, in absence of, uh, of a pandemic emergency, uh, generally the, the risk is uh, a risk for an healthcare associated infection, for example, a bacterial infection. And that is the, the moment in which the, the hospital needs to put in place uh, uh, specific interventions in reaction to, for example, an outbreak. Um, the first one would be clearly to isolate uh, individuals, uh, especially patients, uh, as much as possible. So trying to avoid contacts between individuals. This is something that is routinely done, especially, and also it, it, it is attempted to be done also in emergency rooms uh, where we don't know yet what is the, um, the pathology of each individual arriving in emergency room. So in case there is an infection, of course, we would like to avoid the patient to transmit uh, the other patients who are in the same room. Then, of course, there is the hand washing of healthcare workers who instead will act in reducing the transmissibility of, uh, of the healthcare workers if infected along their contacts. Now, before COVID uh, pandemic, there has been a lot of debate about hand washing in the sense that we know that this works, but on the other hand, uh, several studies who measured 
the adoption of this uh, uh, of this intervention uh, showed that, that uh, adoption is quite uh, quite low. I think that this is going to drastically increase uh, after uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, clearly. Um, and then other options that can be done, uh, especially in reaction to, to an outbreak investigation, would be nurse cohorting. So trying to reduce the number of nurses uh, who are uh, taking care of uh, the same patient. So for example, in the two, in the, in the visualization example here, there are two patients, the ones in the middle, who are both uh, cared by two different nurses. And so the idea would be that each nurse take care, takes care of one patient independently so that there is less uh, risk of transmission from one to the other. And then, of course, there's something that especially natural scientists love to, uh, to consider that would be removal of contacts. Uh, but, but clearly, we know that if it's quite intuitive that if we remove contacts, we are also going to reduce uh, reproductive number and then transmissibility, of course, the risk of transmission in the population. But then on the other hand, these contacts are there because of the function, because they ensure the functioning of, uh, of the hospital. And so they ensure the quality of care of the patient. So this is clearly something that in general we cannot do. Uh, another problem from uh, a, um, an organizational, logistic, but also a theoretical point of view is that this contest change in time. And so there are a lot of, uh, um, a lot, there, there is a, a large set of, uh, of theories and frameworks that allow us to translate the reproductive number into population who are structured uh, along, for example, with a certain heterogeneity of contacts. It's a bit more difficult when we look at the fact that these contacts can also change in time. Um, not only because the number changes from person to person, sorry, not only, not only because the number of contacts for the, a given person changes, changes across time, but also because we need to or to, let's say, to follow and estimate the risk of transmission, we need also to identify the causal paths, uh, uh, paths of transmission. So taking into account that a contact needs to, in order to transmit the disease, need to uh, be established at a certain time so that the person becomes infected and can transmit afterwards. And uh, for example, a person can be largely connected at a given time, but not yet infected, and so will not be able to transmit the disease. So uh, even in this situation, uh, what we, we, we introduced, the, uh, let's say, uh, a, we extended the, the mathematical theory of uh, network epidemiology to temporal networks, and we find that there is a, a critical transmissibility, which is the transmissibility per link, that allows an epidemic to spread. So this is a way of changing from an indicator of the risk of transmission of the spreading potential of a disease that is typically the reproductive number, but which assumes um, an, a mixing that is rather homogeneous or average in the population, average behavior of the population, to something that is instead more critically um, linked to the transmissibility and accounts also for the contacts. Uh, this transmissibility indeed uh, that defines uh, between, distinguishes the two phases. One phase that would be the extinction of, uh, of the epidemic and another phase which instead would be the spread of the epidemic uh, in the population is uh, linked uh, to disease parameters. So if you have, uh, of course, a more contagious uh, disease, it would be more likely that the epidemic will be established in the population. But also it, it, um, is dependent on the context, how the population establishes context and how these contexts are established over time. Here I'm considering, to, to make the theory simpler, I'm, I'm considering uh, a, a very simple uh, compartmental model in which lambda indicates the transmissibility on a context of the disease and then mu indicates um, the, uh, the, the rate of, of recovery or of uh, um, movement from uh, compartment I when we are infectious to another compartment. And I, I left it void because this could represent, for example, different uh, scenarios, a scenario in which we are looking at bacterial health associated infect, uh, healthcare associated infections. Uh, and so after, uh, for example, um, after colonization, uh, individuals could be decolonized and so they would become susceptible to carry 
um, uh, the bacteria again, or in the situation in which we have, for example, a, a, a viral infections like COVID, uh, epidemic, we will need to structure this compartmental model with all the successive compartments that we know are important. But the general lines of the theories would not be altered. And so the, the, how, how do we evaluate this critical transmissibility? Well, it is possible to, to demonstrate that this critical transmissibility can be extracted from the largest eigenvalue of a matrix that we call the uh, infection propagator. This matrix is a product of uh, uh, matrices that take into account elements of the disease. There in the equation, we have the uh, recovery rate mu and we have the transmissibility of the disease. And then we also have this matrix A, uh, dependent on time, that uh, measures the contacts over time. Now in a network, this matrix A is called adjacency matrix and counts uh, um, and, and, and is a repre mathematical representation of the structure of a network at a given time. The element ij of that matrix is equal to one if the nodes, the individuals i and j have a link at that, at that time, or it would be instead equal to zero if the two individuals are not establishing any contacts. And if we look at this matrix, um, this matrix is actually counting the, all the possible paths of transmission uh, between any pair of individuals, uh, considering that the infection needs to be transmitted along these contacts represented by the matrix A, that the transmission can occur with a certain probability that is given by the transmissibility lambda, and also that the, uh, an infectious individual remain infection, infectious for a given amount of time that is given by the inverse of the recovery rate. And this is the reason why it is called the infection propagator. Uh, of course, this is if, if we consider a matrix, uh, so a, a structure of contacts in the population that is static uh, over time, then this goes back uh, to, um, to some approaches that were originally developed in network epidemiology considering uh, structures of population that do not uh, change over time. And for, for any of you who may, may be interested, uh, we, we made the code for the computation of the uh, critical transmissibility available. And so you, you can find that on uh, GitHub. So basically what happens is that if you have data on the contacts over time, you compute this matrix P based on the epidemic model that is uh, uh, targeting, described, parameterized on your uh, disease epidemic, you extract the largest eigenvalue and the largest eigenvalue can uh, provide you with the critical transmissibility. Um, now, what, how do we evaluate interventions? Uh, well, clearly, if uh, uh, the intervention increases uh, the critical transmissibility, then we are in a situation in which we reduce the risk because we are reducing the uh, space of parameters in the transmissibility that allow the epidemic to spread in the population. And the opposite instead would happen uh, in case the intervention would reduce this critical transmissibility. So in that case, we have done something that has increased the risk of transmission. Now we can, just to have an idea of how this works and the role of uh, the different uh, um, roles uh, of individuals within a hospital, we checked for uh, isolation and contact removal as interventions in that geriatric uh, um, world for which we have uh, contact data. And if we do that, so if we isolate a certain number of, uh, an equal number of individuals across different classes, it will be the plot on the left, we find that the, we have a, an important risk reduction only if we, if we isolate nurses. And of course here, this, this is completely unrealistic. We tested in a, in a theoretical fashion because the isolation typically targets patient, doesn't target, of course, uh, professionals who work in the hospital because they need to establish contacts in order to make, uh, to, to make their routine uh, 
um, duties, uh, but we tested across the different classes to show you what, which class would be the one that is mostly responsible for the transmission, so that if we isolate them, there is a larger impact. So we use this as a, as a sort of identification of the class that is mostly responsible for transmission. And the same we can do for pairs of classes. If you remember, we had the largest contact duration in nurses' nurses, and also followed by a, a second largest contact duration in patient nurses. But if we remove contact by keeping the same duration that is removed across different pairs, what we found is that once again, is the contacts established between nurses, which are the ones who are mostly responsible for the risk reduction. And once again, these are theoretical uh, results in the sense that we are not aiming to remove contact between nurses in real life, but we do that in order to identify which are the contacts which are mostly responsible for the spread. So clearly nurses uh, are the ones uh, who, are, are the, who are playing a key role in the transmission, at least in the world uh, under study. This is, however, something that was ve very well known in the literature even before we were able to measure contacts with these technologies. So we knew it from um, uh, paper surveys, we knew from um, video monitoring, and indeed we knew that nurses, that there is this paradox in that nurses are the ones who need to establish these contacts for caring patients and also to provide a link between patients and doctors very often, but at the same time, this same behavior puts them at higher risk of being infected and then of largely transmitting uh, the disease to uh, possibly their contacts. So somehow, and here I'm using, of course, a term in, in quotes, so somehow they show this behavioral uh, type of super spreading um, driver. Now, given that we cannot isolate, of course, nurses and we cannot even uh, uh, remove the contacts that they establish because we assume that all of these contacts are necessary, we thought about a different uh, uh, type of protocol uh, to, to be implemented to, in order to reduce the risk. And in particular, we thought, well, there are situations in which, for example, we have nurse I and nurse J who are both active at time T. So their activation function is equal to one. And then at time T plus one, this is on the plot, on the visualization on the left, based on the empirical data, we have the nurse I is establishing some contacts while instead the nurse J doesn't do that. And the idea that we had was, okay, why don't we preserve those contacts? But we ask, another nurse to perform those tasks instead of the ones which actually performed those tasks in the reality. And so we uh, assign those contacts to, for example, nurse J. We can do that with a certain law and we introduced uh, this law which is, which is a, a sort of a, of a potential that optimizes the timeline of activity of the nurses and can be defined, for example, depending on a given parameter. Here we define it as a k parameter, which a k equal minus one, that tends to create regular schedules of activity of nurses um, at work. And you can see, for example, a, a, a pattern on the right from the empirical data to how this reorganization would create a regular pattern for a nurse. Or instead, if we change the sign, it means that we are attract changing the optimization of this activity pattern. And what we observe is that we have a more irregular pattern. So we could have, for example, in the visualization we provide that the nurse works a certain number of hours, have a small pause, and then restart again. Of course, this needs uh, to uh, take care of different aspects. Now, positive aspects, it preserves the number of contacts. So we're not removing any contacts because we assume that these are important to ensure the quality of care. Uh, but we allow for other nurses uh, to uh, perform those duties. Of course, it also preserves the type of contact because those are still contacts established by nurses with patients. And, uh, um, and, and there under, underneath there is the assumption that nurses have equal competence in order to establish those contacts. Um, and then also the duration of contacts uh, is preserved. Um, 
of course, we need to take into account some constraints in the creation of these uh, regular and irregular schedules. So, for example, shift duration cannot go, be, uh, go beyond uh, uh, what allowed by, by law. So we cannot ask uh, a nurse to work for 40 hours uh, straight. Uh, something that the model would like to have in order, of course, to reduce the total number of nurses uh, in the hospital. So we need, of course, to uh, keep that into account. And also we need to um, preserve the total workload. Uh, there we had only four days. So we had the total amount of work, of hours uh, worked by each nurse, and we preserve that as well. So we can think about different combinations of these constraints. And to give you an idea, of, uh, of the results. Um, on the top, you have the reduction of the risk um, in, in percentage with risk relative uh, to the previous situation where the intervention is not performed. And according to the type of constraints that we have, that there are possibilities in which, for example, we preserve uh, the shift and the workload with a certain type of schedules. And we can also arrive to 25 to 30 percent reduction of the risk in the hospital, which is quite high if we think that we are not, we are reorganizing the activity of the nurses, but without compromising uh, the care. Uh, then, of course, we can also worsen the situation. So under certain conditions, our reorganization actually increases the risk of a 5%. Now, below, uh, I'm showing you what uh, this risk reduction could be achieved if uh, we uh, assume that we were able to reduce, to remove nurses-nurses contacts, which we're not doing in order to preserve the functioning of the hospital. But if we were to do that, um, for example, the highest risk reduction on the top would correspond to removing more than 30% of nurse-nurse contacts. So this would be a strong disruption of, uh, of the structure of, uh, of the uh, population connection within the hospital. Then we can also it's look... Okay. Yes, I'm almost done. Yes, if you could wind up so to leave a bit yes. of time for questions, please. Absolutely. Okay, um, thanks. And, and also what happens is that this is not really related to nurse cohorting, which is a measure that is uh, typically uh, used within the hospital. So the reduction of the number of nurses per patient. But th what we saw is that it allows to reduce, it, to reduce the super spreading behavior of nurses. Uh, so if we see at the, the bottom right uh, plot, uh, there, we are plotting the standard deviation of the number of contacts of nurses. And we see that in all scenarios that allow to reduce the risk, this would allow to um, uh, also reduce uh, the super spreading behavior of nurses. While instead, in the only scenario in which we increase the risk, this is because we are highly increasing uh, their super spreading behavior. So super spreading is really what is responsible uh, for the spread in that population. Uh, just to mention that, of course, this is a sort of uh, uh, proof of concept that the potential can be uh, improved by considering other soft constraints, which could be related to the organization of each uh, specific hospital, they have uh, additional personnel, etc. And this will be done, of course, in further work when we have also longer uh, contact data. And I would like just to thank my collaborators on, uh, on this, and I'm happy to get your questions. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps you could unshare your screen, please. Sure. So we can see everyone. Okay. So, do we have any? Do you have any questions? If uh, um, so, we have a question from Carl Pearson. Carl, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. I, I put it in the chat, but also I, I can I can say it aloud. So. When you're talking about um, type of contact in there, how, uh, how in detail do you get into task performed? Um, because it seems like there is, I suspect that there are specialized tasks amongst nurses. I mean, they're not just all nurse only. Um, and so how much are you all thinking about things that might require uh, specialized training or credentialing, um, things that represent 
like division of labor stuff, like new nurses do this task, whereas more senior nurses, like it's, it's not a fun task, so the junior folks have to do it. And then as people get more senior, that task gets pushed down into the, the junior ranks. Um, how, how much of that is in this analysis? Thank you, Carl. For the moment, it's not taken into account. So this is one of the big limitations of the study, and this is the reason why I called it a proof of concept in the sense that we didn't have enough data to, uh, uh, to categorize better the specialty of each nurse. So we just had the identification of nurse and, and nothing more. Um, there are some studies which have been performed and then later on, and others which are in the planning that uh, will collect this additional data. Um, so at the moment we couldn't do that. We are very well aware indeed that, for example, the um, potential uh, doesn't include that element. Uh, envisioning to have that information, um, what, what could be changed is really the form uh, and the, the, the functional form of the potential in order to allow changes exclusively across, for example, nurses uh, with the same uh, expertise uh, or with the same uh, uh, specialization, clearly, um, but at the moment we couldn't do that. Uh, another question, could, could, could we use this approach to help schools and workplaces to come up with their best way to reopen? So we're doing that for the moment with the data on the schools in France and we are looking at something a little different which is because there we have of course lectures and so the structure is a bit more um, well organized, it's organized differently of course across time. There are hours of lectures, then there are pauses, uh, recreational activities, uh, lunches, breaks, etc. So what we're doing is that we're looking at how contacts are established with across classes of the same grade and also across, across different grades and uh, looking whether we can phase out, uh, um, for example, uh, breaks, uh, recreational activities or lunch breaks as well uh, in order to reduce these contacts and preserve instead the contacts within each class. We assume that when you go to school, contacts within the class are hard to, to avoid except for the physical distancing as much as can be done uh, by the school, but we wish we would like to see a, a enough, uh, a strong enough reduction of uh, in the epidemic risk by avoiding, for example, across classes contacts. And this is what we're currently working on. Jean uh, Paolo, you had a question. Yes, just a short one, which might coincide with others. Just about the applicability of this to other places than hospitals. It's about disrupting, I guess, the, the contact network of a group of people. Has it been experimented in practice somewhere, some little clinic or hospital that was wanting to change the work scheme to see if it worked? Yes, so one of the, let's say, what we had in mind is that this could be used for optimizing this context, even not as a reaction to an outbreak, but really in the planning. Uh, there is a, an optimization which is uh, very well known uh, in the operational field uh, for hospital, which is the nurse uh, scheduling problem, uh, which is basically organizing the schedule of, uh, of, uh, of your ward uh, taking into account the needs of the hospital, the needs of individuals, uh, and then of course other things like part-time uh, part um, work, uh, um, vacation days, uh, etc. This is typically done by, performed by, let's say, it has a research direction into management and computer science independently. Um, and this is done by very heavy optimization tools, uh, which somehow in an unsupervised way provide possible schedules uh, to the management of the hospitals, respecting all the constraints. And there I was mentioning, for example, heart constraints, uh, nurse cannot work uh, more than a shift, uh, and then the soft constraints, uh, for example, asking for uh, days off uh, in, in a given pattern. Um, so the idea that we would like to propose once we get additional data is really to implement this within the nurse scheduling problem that for the moment only uh, focuses on the schedule and doesn't focus is also on reducing the risk and this the potential could be an additional uh, element to, to be integrated in this optimization. Okay, so I think yeah. you had another question. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. Hi, sorry, asking multiple questions. Um, I was just wondering, so one of my concerns with all this complex isolating within schools is that actually it's not doing much for children's mental health, but we're not actually possibly reducing transmission anyway. So we're making lots and lots of complex rules that teachers are trying to implement and not really. So ideally, it would be good to do some RFID studies in schools. Um, what's the sort of cost implication and um, like GDPR type thing? Have you, you mentioned that you've done a few in schools? Yeah, I, I, I collaborated with the team that implemented. So I, I'm not on the practical and technical point of view. I'm not the one I can put you in contact with some of the people. So I cannot give you an estimate of, of the tags. Uh, let's say in the last 10 years, uh, um, tags have become very much cheaper than what it was before. It can also be reused. So I know that, for example, for some groups where some schools have purchased lar larger bunches, have run a first experiment, and then anyway, they kept they, they are RFID in order to redo them again because you just need to change a little battery. Um, and, and I agree with you, we need, we need more studies, especially like in these conditions. In the last 10 years, especially because let's say after uh, 2009 pandemic, uh, we know that for pandemic flu, there is a, an important role of schools in transmission. A lot of the studies were done for that reason. And, and they have been exhausting many, many different settings. Um, somehow mapping uh, these contexts in different environments. I think that so first preliminary understanding of how contexts are established in different uh, environments is established. But then in order to, to do more like a study of this type or one you mentioned, of course we need to go beyond, especially in the duration. Uh, and especially when conditions, behavioral conditions change, for example, right now that conditions at schools have changed with respect to normal condition. And we need to understand whether the change in context is enough for reducing the spread, or as you say, there is anyway enough promiscuity and, uh, and, and, and for example, possibility of touching surfaces, infected surfaces that anyway prevent that type of approach. Uh, Jean Paolo, you had a Question. I have already asked mine, but Peter has oh, a question. Yes, Peter, has a question. Peter and, yeah. and Carl's another. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the nice uh, talk. Uh, my question is perhaps more towards the mathematics. Uh, you are, you were talking about the critical infectivity or the lambda c, as you call it. Um, now. In some mathematical models, uh, which uh, include SIS epidemics, but also SIR epidemics, where there are uh, uh, in a varying environment, uh, so where you have high infectivity times and low infectivity times, which might be weekends, so that might be relevant for schools. It's not necessarily the case that um, increasing the infectivity will increase the chance of a large outbreak. So you might actually, by increasing the infectivity, move the peak to a weekend, for example, and, and actually uh, prevent an outbreak. So that might be a problem in the definition. There is no monotonicity, necessarily monotonicity in Lambda. And the thing with the, especially with SIS epidemics, you by decreasing the infectivity, you can actually uh, move uh, a disease to an endemic regime from an epidemic regime where it dies out after a peak. So did you think this through or? Uh, Peter, I think that this is uh, extremely important, uh, but uh, let's say, it's not applicable to the framework in the sense that what you're stating in the change, it, for us, the change is captured exclusively in context. So if we think about summer and we have a reduction of transmissibility during summer, and then we have an increase of transmissibility, for example, during winter, and we know that this could lead to higher, uh, for example, waves during winter for pandemic flu, or what you were saying about weekends versus weekdays. This is a problem of, uh, uh, synchrony between how transmissibility changes and how the patterns of contact changes. 
And for the, so I, I totally agree with you, but it's not something that we are looking at within the model. So in the model, we are looking exclusively at how contacts change, assuming that transmissibility per contact stays the same. So if we would, transmissibility that is per contact. So if we were needed, if we were to modulate also transmissibility, then we would see, for example, synchrony effects. We could be seeing synchrony effects, as you are saying, but we could not, we, we cannot see them there. And that, that's, that's why for us, an increase of the critical transmissibility always correspond to a, a, a decrease of the epidemic risk because the, the entire information of the change across time is exclusively in the context. I thought, well, thanks very much, Victoria. I think we should wrap up this session for now. So thank you very, very much for, for speaking to us because I know you are extremely busy. Um, we, uh, um, you'll be very welcome to stay on either now or, or revisit the workshop later in the week and we will keep you on the list so you get the links in case you have time to join in anything. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. So to, to, to move on, um, the, the next session is supposed to be a, a short social session, but also discussing what topics we might like to discuss in smaller groups. So after about 10 minutes, the idea is to put you in breakout rooms. And I have a couple of discussion points I would like you to address. But if in the 10 minutes of chat, we come up with something you would have more in preference of discussing, we, 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 will, we can do that instead. So we're going to take a short break where you can get the, depending on your time zone, you can get the drink of your choice and we'll resume in three or five minutes. Um, Megan, could I share my screen just while we're taking the break? Uh, yes, one second. I will. You should be able to, uh, you are co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave you looking at that mm -hmm. and see how many, um, of this year's participants you can recognize while I make a copy mm. and we'll start up again in three or four minutes. <laughs> 